I don't know how many of you all are aware there's a forest in Mumbai, so much so that people can get a PhD or doctor. Okay. So can you imagine waking up to poor calls where there's trees enveloped with nature, there's a golden hue of sunlight painting everything in the existing yellow, and every day there's some adventure waiting for you. For me, I spent my two years doing my masters in wildlife sciences. That was life to me. Now. So every day was a new thing. Like you had board calls to wake you up, and you had a million fireflies to put you to sleep at night. So we didn't have a dim light. We had fireflies. I was learning about bird anatomy. You know how birds fly, why they have so and so feathers, why they have you know a particular beak. I was learning about Himalayan thorns, how they live a life literally on the edge. I was learning about saltwater crocodiles living in Bitter Kanika in a macro habitat. I was spending my afternoons in a central Indian landscape, you know, lazing around with tigers. But as a career in Bike Lake, this is what it offered. But there was a time when I was at crossroads of my career where I had to choose between two options. Whether I take the safe, secure option or I go follow my passion. So luckily at that time there was this amazing movie called as Three Years, which helped my helped me convince my parents with an easy dialogue. I'll have a smaller house, I'll have a smaller car, but I'll be happy. That's what happens when you choose your passion, you make it your work. Because you're not working there. Every day is a vacation. Like all these pictures, people would have posted them if they would have gone on a vacation. But I was working and studying growing up. And so I had an uncle at that time who so as a good guide, a good guy, good mentor, who helped people, like people on my family side, understand why it is important to follow your passion, why it is important to go where your liking is. At that time, I was also introduced to this big cat TV called as Wagoba. Wagoba is a big cat TV represented by leopards or tigers, and this is a relationship which the animal shares with people. So this TV is being worshipped by Wadi's tribal staying in this world. Which reminds me of my first tiger sighting. Everyone has a tiger sighting which is special to them. Mine was also special. Again, it was an Indian landscape in Balnogar, where it, we spent four days. Everyone from my college had seen a tiger, but me. They like my gypsy, and then they had stopped taking me along on their rides because I was supposed to be the unlucky person, and they were not seeing tigers. But on the last day, we get this news, and that time they, they had walkie talkies. You know, so our driver gets a call that there's a tiger, you know, there's going to be a sighting. But unfortunately, the day is, you know, it is, the sun is going down, so we are losing light. But in that, there's so much adrenaline gushing through us. Like I dropped my camera, I dropped my phone, and it's gone for life now. But I was super excited, okay, I'm going to finally see my tiger. I'm riding, riding, and we're going very fast. Like our whole face is covered with dust. Continuously, there are people shouting, you know, not shouting loudly, but <laughs> finally we reach this spot and there are like 20 vehicles. I can't see the tiger, I can only see hair. Okay, the human hair, so all of them are trying to duck. See the tiger. Luckily for us, the tiger, the tigress came out from a different direction. She comes down and that beautiful, majestic lady, as she's taking slow steps, she comes down. She comes to the water hole and it doesn't end there. She looks behind, there's a cow. The cow comes down. She helps the cow get down. Both of them are like on the water, lapping water through the you know, like, amazing sight. But this glamour of my first tiger sighting was not a long lived memory for me. Just a couple of months later, when I was in the Central Indian landscape again, volunteering with a particular institution where we were interviewing villagers, talking to them and to try to understand what are these illegal activities like hunting, uh, forest food, for, uh, not type of forest product collection, how is it affecting the tigers and their well-being. And in that, in that particular period, I met this one villager, he asked me a question and that really made me think twice. I didn't have a reply. And he asked me, who are you to tell us anything about what should we do with tigers or the forest? We've been living for generations with tigers. Now, I still had my memory of the tigers and the cub getting down, but I could not agree more with it. I really didn't know it. And that's when I realized in India, the concept of wildlife and humans, you cannot treat them separately. Each. 
I mean, just mentioned, have the highest population. Okay, so there are a lot of people, there are a lot of wildlife living together. That's when I realized I wanted to study this human-animal interactions. And there is no other place to do this than Mumbai. Okay, in Mumbai, you have this national park called the Sanjay Gandhi National Park. It is right in the heart of the city. And every day I was shuffling between two worlds. One was the city and one was the forest. Okay, and there was this leopard which was readily breaking these boundaries. So they were there in the city, they were there in the forest. And I wanted to understand this because it was a unique perspective where you have the highest density of leopards surviving in an area right in the heart of the city. So we wanted to count the leopards. Uh, counting a leopard is a leopard census. And I clearly cannot do it like how we have our census. How many people how many people, how many males, how many females. I could not go and talk to leopards. So what we do is we set these camera traps in the forest which have remotely sensor triggers in it. So the moment an animal crosses it, it clicks. Somewhat like this. This, this was a night when we gone to check on our camera trap image. And while I was doing this, there were alarm calls. Now an alarm call is something which is herbivore gives. And in this case, herbivores are like deers and monkeys. So if I'm a deer and if I see a leopard, I'll give calls like, ow, ow. So you know, all my fellow mates get to know there's a leopard around. And you know, they're aware. So while this was happening, we were getting these alarm calls. And I had a very joking manner tell my field assistant, for all you know, while we are doing this, there might be a leopard behind us watching it. And exactly after a couple of minutes, there was a leopard right behind us. But this leopard didn't kill us. This leopard didn't attack us. Not that it knew this is the research team. I should not eat them because if I eat them, there will be no one to do this at all. For the leopard, it was simple. It's a human being and I should be wary. I should be careful. And because we were taking a simple precaution of using torch lights, talking to each other loudly, all these things give the leopard a pre-warning. So like there is someone around and I should be careful, I should not venture into it. And this is how the leopard is. A leopard is a very shy, secretive animal who is very scared of humans, who always tries to keep away from humans. But in Mumbai I was seeing leopards from CCTV footages, hiding behind cars, running behind dogs. So why was it doing? So as much as I would like to glorify all these wild encounters with the forest and its denizens, it has not always been pretty and exhilarating. I have to do some dirty job of putting you know, his bare hands into leopard poo, a leopard stool. Because leopard poo is filled with information. Whatever they eat, the undigested material comes out of their bone. And we Indian scientists go collect it, trying to understand what the leopard has fed upon. For all you know, if the leopard actually saw us collecting that, he would be like, I didn't know so much information was coming out of there. So we would collect this stool which will help us understand what it has spread upon. And which clearly showed the leopard died in Mumbai. Was also majorly represented by cats, dogs, rats. Also dogs contributed to a majority of their diet in Mumbai. And why were there dogs? Because we had a city right on the periphery of SCN. We generate a lot of garbage. This garbage attracts a lot of dogs, cats, rats. So the leopards were not actually going out of the forest, we were attracting them outside of the forest. You know? And the leopard being an adult, but the most adaptable animal, he was very happy. The dogs are like vada pao today. Vada pao is fast food for us. It's easily available, it's energy rich. I'm putting less energy, I get out more energy. Same was the case with dogs. Now so that is where the interaction part comes. Leopards in Mumbai, eventually you were interacting with three major categories. Number one was Varlis. I showed you the Vaguvali. One of my Varli friends once told me a story. Like one winter evening, sitting out, there, out of their house, there's a bonfire, they are discussing recent issues. And suddenly in the shadows of the bonfire, they see a figure walking towards them. It's very hazy because there's very little light. But then the figure is a little closer and then they can make a leopard out of it. Okay, and then this one person from the bonfire set up, stands up, looks at the leopard, the leopard is looking at them, and just scores back. And he recited the story to me. I'm like, are you out of your mind? There was a leopard in front of you, you just stood and you sat back. And his reply was, yeah, maybe he had come to take a dog, but he realized we were there, so he went back. And that is how their traditional indigenous knowledge was helping them survive. But not all categories are used to leopards. 
There is a category of people living in high rises, like us, we live in society apartments, who stay just on the periphery of the park and get to see leopards on their uh, balconies. So once we have a Facebook page where once someone had put a post, when he clipped a leopard sitting in front of their building, I'm brushing my teeth and I'm seeing this leopard in front of my house, I don't know what to do. And someone had gone outright in the next minute and commented in that post, maybe you should pay money because I went to Tadoba and I did not get to see a leopard. You are seeing one and brushing your teeth. So then we have this second kind who are not interacting much with the leopards, but are also reacting a lot. And there's a third category, which is encroachers. Many times you have enclosures, slums, along the periphery of the park who don't really have much knowledge about how to live with the leopard but they're still there because the, the space is available to them. And because of the surroundings, the leopards get attracted to them. Like one of my friends, uh, you would have heard stories of, you know, uh, cockroach drop from my ceiling, uh, lizard drop from my ceiling. In this case, he's telling me a leopard drop from my ceiling. So that is how close they are living with them. This fellow fortunately was very 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 fortunate because there were people in the house when the leopard dropped off from the ceiling and it ran out, people ran out, no one was harmed. But not always is this happy go lucky. Sometimes and Mumbai has a past record of attacks happening on people. A recent attack which happened a couple of years ago along the periphery of the park when a doctor and mother, a seven year old doctor had got out of their house along the periphery of the park because the daughter wanted to poop. Now while the daughter is squatting next to the mother doing a business, a quarrel broke out in the neighborhood which attracted the mother's attention, made the mother go in that direction. She went far away from her daughter and the daughter was attacked by a devil and she was killed. And this time what, did, what went wrong is the options were not taken. Because, and because they were not aware that not that badly people don't face reports, but they know how to deal with the report. They know how to deal with the forest. So basic precaution, basic basic awareness helps the people survive with the report, live with the report. And we regularly have these awareness sessions for schools, for slums, where we just go and tell them do's and don'ts about reports. What you should do while there's a leopard, what you should not do, what you should do to not attract it, what you should do to keep away from it. And then these things slowly started. And this is not only happening in Mumbai. Most of our cities in around India, there is this problem. This is one incident which took place in Gurgaon, which didn't really end well because the leopard was killed by the people in the end. Actually, there was a journalist there who made some amazing images. But not always does it turn out to be good. What went wrong here is people were not very aware. So they didn't know how to handle the situation. And this means Mumbai, we have a very trained rescue team who goes through such situations. The animal is rescued, people are safe. All that said, there are also happy stories happening. This is from Western Maharashtra in Jurnar, where there is a sugarcane landscape. And when they are harvesting sugarcane, sometimes they come across leopard tops. Okay, what they do with these leopard tops? In the night, they are put there in the field again, covered with a crate. The mother comes back, that is struggling through the crate, it cracks open the crate, takes the cubs, of course she takes them to some other field then, but then the cubs are reunited back. So people are now slowly getting aware, there are been interventions taken to live with this, to live with the birds, to live with wildlife. But that was the first olive ridley turtle I saw. Olive ridley turtles are the smallest turtle which you get in the ocean. And along the eastern coast of India, you have a mass nesting which takes space of olive really turtles. And this was a gravid female where you can see some part of the intestine out, there are some eggs. And I was very sad because my first olive really turtle, I didn't want to see it this way. But she was upside down, these eggs from which, you know, there would have been turtle babies emerging out, dogs, stray dogs were feeding on it. And why this was happening? Because traditionally the coast, had you know, indigenous methods of fishing. Now you have mechanic, mechanized trawlers doing it, a lot of other exploration happening in the sea. So why these gravid females are coming back to the shore to lay their eggs, have a future with the babies? What is happening is they get killed and they get washed. You know, so many times, if we don't have planned developmental activities, it hurts them and in return, this is also going to affect us because you know. Everything is dependent on the forest. 
We don't get food from supermarkets. It is growth. We don't get water from the tap. It's naturally available. So if you alter the natural system, it is going to have a cascading effect back. Again, that said, I was a sad part of the olive ready turtles, but earlier this year, this is the baby olive ready turtle I saw. So there's a village in Maharashtra where villagers along with forest department, when the females come to nest, they go safeguard that nest, they collect the eggs, they wait, they give it protection till the incubation is done. And it's a very magical moment for others who've never experienced this. Suddenly your sand, your beach sand starts moving with a depression and these baby turtles come out. And then they take that long yard towards the sea for a never ending long journey. So there is hope. There is people, there are alternatives. Now this can change, this can go ahead. So it's that we have to take those. We have to take that change. We have to make that change. And India has been a country where we are, we have, we are so rich in culture. We are also very tolerant towards wildlife. We have a lot of faith in it. We respect wildlife. And in return, this has helped the overall conservation picture. You know, so if we keep doing this, it's going to be good for us. And already the leopards and wildlife are doing their bit by living with us, by adapting to our change. It's our bit, it's our turn now to learn the art of living with leopards, wildlife, everything else which is moving, crawling around. Thank you.